Triathlons can seem overwhelming from the outside. What do you mean I have to train in three different sports and then there's all that equipment? A lot of people don't know where to start. In this episode, we go over how to get started, what you actually need, and things you need to know before signing up for your first race. Welcome to the Working Mother Triathlete Podcast. I'm here to help you achieve a healthy, well-balanced life so you can feel prepared and ready to achieve your triathlon goals. Remember to follow us on Instagram and YouTube at Working Mother Triathlete. A quick search in Google will reveal tons of different training plans for the casual triathlete, and a search on Amazon will produce tons of triathlon gear that can be purchased for either races or training. Knowing where to start can be overwhelming, and jumping in and buying what appears to be the newest and best training gear is tempting for many, but could just end up as a waste of money. Before buying anything, there are a number of other steps that should be taken, which will inform you on what you should actually need to purchase, if anything at all. First and foremost, you should figure out what your goal is. Why are you doing a triathlon? For some, the answer may be to get into better shape. Some others may be checking an item off their bucket list, while others are just getting involved as a way to bring an active, healthy lifestyle change to their life. Personally, I started doing triathlons because my husband asked me to do one with him after he started doing them. So my initial goal was to finish a race without feeling horrible. I didn't want to be that person bent over throwing up at the finish line. And that seemed easy and simple. After that race, I wanted more. I loved how it felt when I finished the race. I liked how I felt when I was done with the tra- uh, training for the day. And I loved how it felt when I crossed that finish line. A sense of accomplishment that I'd met a goal that I'd set for myself. Once you know why you're looking to do this, you should consider what type of event you want to do. Triathlons come in many different shapes and sizes. When looking for an event, you should consider the location, the distance, the course, and the time of year. There's a great website, TriFinder, that I'll link to in the show notes where you can search for races based on location. Uh, So first of all, you want to look at the actual location. Do you want to travel to this race or do you just want to be able to drive, get up in the morning and drive there? So for for, uh, me and hubby, most of the time we're doing races where we can get up and it's within an hour and a half of our house. So we don't have to go anywhere. It minimizes the cost and, and is easy and simple to get to. And it gives us the ability, to, if we want, to go out and train on the course beforehand, do some practice runs. Especially, we live in a very hilly area, so the bike rides can be challenging at times. So it's nice to get out there beforehand with our Garmin or our uh, Wahoo tracker and uh, be able to kind of map out and do the course beforehand. It's always a nice perk of doing a local race. The next thing you're going to want to look at is distance. There are five different triathlon distances. There's sprint, Olympic, half distance, which is also known as 70.3, long course, and then ultra triathlons. While there can be many small differences, especially for sprint races, generally they kind of are as follows. So a sprint race is usually about a half mile swim, about a 13 mile bike ride, followed by a 5k run. Olympic races are just shy of a mile on the swim, about 0.9 miles usually. Usually about a 24 to 26 mile bike ride, followed by a 10K run. A half distance, you're swimming 1.2 miles. It's a 56 mile bike ride, and then a half marathon or 13.1 miles to end the race. Long course, which is what when you think Kona and Hawaii, the big triathlon that everyone, the professionals talk about every year, uh, that's a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride and a marathon or 26.2 mile run at the end. And then ultra marathons are longer than a long course and they are varying distances. Some of these can even take, you know, 24 plus hours to complete depending on the distance as well as your physical capabilities. Be realistic about what distance you have time to train for and what you're capable of doing. Completing any distance of a triathlon is an amazing accomplishment. For example, my husband and I, we've only thus far done sprint and Olympic distance races because when we look at our schedule between the kids' activities, our work schedule, we only have so much left time time left in the day to actually train. And, you know, setting while we do want to eventually get move up to those longer distances, when you look at, you know, 2021, for example, not knowing what it's going to look like after most races were canceled in 2020, we don't want to put in the time and F, uh, energy And the time away from our kids, frankly, to train for a 70.3 that might not end up happening. So this year we decided to stick with the shorter races 
again, they're also local. So, uh, you know, should they get canceled, we're not losing money on plane tickets or hotels or anything else like that. So think about all those uh, things as you're trying to pick your, your race course. So what does the course look like? Is it flat? Is it hilly? Is it swim in the ocean or a lake or a river or a pool in a handful of cases? All these are different factors that will uh, affect how you need to train for your race. So, you know, if you have an ocean swim, for example, if you're doing a race down in Florida, do you have time to get out to the ocean and practice? Do you have access? I know where I live. We, we don't really. We have, you know, I live in southern Connecticut. We have access to the Long Island Sound. It, it's, it's, it's the sound. It's not the ocean. It's a very different feel than if we were to actually go out and swim off the coast of Florida, for example, um, so keep those things in mind when you're training and planning so that you can train for your races properly. And then the last thing you want to, to think about when picking a race is the time of year. So if you live in a warm area, warm climate area like Florida, Texas, Arizona, or some are even further south, this doesn't really affect you as much. There's likely races year round and you have a lot more flexibility. But where I live in New England, obviously we have a lot of cold weather up here. Uh, about half of our year, it's really too cold to race, especially to be in that water swimming. Otherwise, you're going to get hypothermia. So our races at the beginning of the season that are, you know, for us, really the beginning of the full tri season would be really in May, unless you're doing an indoor race, would, you know, probably require a wetsuit, for example, on the swim. And maybe you need little booties or uh, an extra kind of thicker neoprene cap when you're swimming to stay warm. So those are all things you should think about before deciding what race you want to sign up for and how far you want to go. Once you figure out what race you're doing, what you really need to think about is the training that would be necessary for you to be able to successfully finish that race. Now, everyone's going to have a different goal, and this is where you really need to look at your why that we talked about in the prior episode of why are you doing this? What, what are you trying to achieve by, by doing your triathlon? So there's a couple different things to take into account when you're thinking about your training and what you're going to need to do. The first one is you're going to want to be some have some level of fitness or some ability to complete all three sports. So this is where the distance of which race you're doing comes into play. So if you're doing something like a sprint triathlon where there's only a half mile swim, 12, mile, 12 to 13 mile bike ride, and a 5K at the end, you're not going to need to put in nearly as much training or workouts to get fit across all three sports or capable of completing them as you are for something like a 70.3. So the training you need to do is going to vary depending on the race. The other thing you're going to need to look at is, what, you know, we talked about the the course and, and what the course is like. If it's something it, uh, like what I deal with up here in New England frequently, a lot of our horse, uh, courses are very hilly. So I have to do a lot more training on hills, which makes my workouts a lot harder, even an easy workout, because I'm having to still do that extra work, put in the extra watts when I'm going uphill than if I were, say, in the Midwest, where I'm able to, you know, have cornfields and then ride a very flat ride, or even down in Florida or Texas tend to be flatter courses as well. So you're going to want to take that into account. That's why I said you need to know what your course is like when you're picking what your race, because that allows you to pick what kind of training makes sense. So looking at more of a, a, a kind of what, it, what is the minimum that I would recommend if you're looking to, to get into this is I would say find time to train in each sport two times a week. I think to be able to feel comfortable completing the race, not feeling, you know, not crawling over the finish line, not feeling like you're going to throw up as soon as you're done necessarily. If you do each, you know, swim twice a week, bike twice a week, run twice a week, you should get to a good level of fitness. All this is going to depend obviously on what your fitness level is coming in as well, as well as your skill level. So and you're not going to want to do those back to back. You're going to want to intermix them uh, on my my website, uh, which is linked in the show notes. We have a sample uh, sprint training plan that's free for, uh, for you guys to download. If you want to see what kind of plan uh, I would put in place if I were when I was first running my my doing my first uh, sprint triathlons. 
Ideally, you're also going to want to give yourself anywhere from 8 to 12 weeks. Again, it's going to depend on the length of race you're running. The longer the race you're doing, the more time you want to give yourself to kind of ramp up and get ready. And throughout these trainings, you're going to work on a bunch of different things. So you're going to not, you can, you can go out there and you can just ride your bike. You can go out there and you can just run. If you want to improve your times, if you want to, again, make sure you're finishing those races feeling good and strong, there's a couple specific things I would recommend you, you think about doing and make sure you incorporate. The first one, and I think probably the most important one, are called brick workouts. If you look at my Instagram stories, you'll see me talk about these. Um, I try to get them in twice a week. A brick workout, when people say they're doing a brick workout, usually what they're referring to is they're doing a bike workout and they're immediately or within a short period of time getting off the bike and going into doing a run. Now, brick workout simply just means you're doing two workouts consecutively back to back. So this could be swim and then run. It could be swim and then bike or bike and then swim or any combination of of the three sports. I've I've done all I've done all those versions, just depending really on my schedule. But the one I specifically train for is going from the bike to the run. And the reason I do that and make sure I try to get that in twice a week is because when you come off the bike at that point, you've put very little weight on your legs at that point, right? You can't, you've, you've swam or you have the water booing you up, especially if you were wearing a wetsuit um, and if it was an ocean uh, or saltwater swim. And then you're going to... You know, while you, yes, you have to run or jog or walk up to transition, then you're hopping on your bike. And while, yes, you're most definitely working your legs on the bike, it's a very different set of muscles than when you're actually out there running around. So when you get off the bike, people tend to have wobbly legs. It's very odd feeling the first time you do it. I remember the first time I did it a couple years ago. I felt like I was going to fall over. I was almost like I had already run a marathon, then biked and was trying to do a run again or something. So it's it's an odd sensation. Practicing beforehand is so incredibly helpful because then when you go into a race, you know how your body is going to respond and you don't have that wobbly leg sensation, hopefully, if you've trained uh, properly there. Training with others is another really... uh, great way to train another tip I have there I you know do a mixture of training by myself and training with others it helps for me personally that my husband also does triathlon so we do um, especially on the weekends do a lot of our training sessions together Uh, we know, get someone to watch our kids and we'll go out for go a two-hour bike ride or you know go out and pop pop off on a nine mile uh, easy run or something like that but now, not everyone has that ability. The other thing that I personally do is in the mornings when I'm doing my strength training, I'm on Zoom with a bunch of other girls. Um, we we do our training together in the morning, and then I go from there and I go out and I do whatever other workout I have for the day. If I have something else to do in the morning, whether it's a run or now, you know, when the weather is nicer, I bring my bike to work and I'll pop out and do a bike ride uh, here down at my near my office before coming in and sitting at my desk and getting to work. It also helps hold you accountable, right? If you know someone is relaying, you know, waiting for you at the gym or waiting for you at the track or wherever it is you're going for your workout or comes to your house, it's very hard to back out of a workout when that other person is there to do it with you. So it's a great way to make sure you get in your training sessions and you have that accountability partner there with you. Specifically, when you're doing the workouts, once a week, I do something that focuses on endurance. So usually for me, I do those on the weekends because I do work Monday through Friday. So on Saturday and Sunday, one day I'll get in a long run. One day I'll get in a long bike ride. When it is warmer out, I flip those around depending on the weather. Uh, While I can run in the rain, I do not bike outside in the rain. Our roads where I live are way too narrow and turny, twisty and turny for me to feel comfortable being on the bike in the rain outside of a race environment. So I'll, I'll, you know, if it's raining all weekend, I'll do, do them inside. We do have, we, we've set up equipment in our house so that we can do these indoors if we have to, especially because where I live at least six months of the year, it's pretty cold. We can have snow and it's may not be safe for us to actually train outside. So those are all considerations as well. And then consistency is key. So, you know, like I said, it's, you know, you, you're looking at Again, to not be crawling across finish lines or throwing up throughout the race because your your body's not used to it. 
the more consistent you train over that 8 to 12 or longer week period, the more change you'll see in your body and your ability to be able to complete these. I was, I've always had trouble with consistency until recently. It's that this is where the accountability partner comes in. Having someone who is waiting for you, looking for you, you're going to be more consistent in your training. And when you're consistent, that's when you see results. So I, you know, again, this goes back to your why, why are you doing this? If you're looking to check something off your bucket list, you have You know, there's no cutoff times for your race. You don't care what you feel like when you cross the finish line. Consistency may not be as important to you. But for those of you who want to, you know, cross that finish line feeling good, possibly even be somewhat competitive depending on your age group, consistency is where you're going to get that improvement. So now the other must-haves. So I know we we mentioned at the beginning when you get involved in triathlon, you, if you go pull up videos, you'll see a lot of professional triathletes have YouTube channels out there and are sharing with us their workouts, what their life looks like, and they have a lot of fancy equipment. They have a lot of stuff. For the average amateur triathlete, you do not need the vast majority of that stuff. It can be very tempting if you go on Amazon and do a quick search. Again, you'll see a lot of different potential equipment pop up that you could go out and buy. I would know I was very tempted to do that. I'm like, ooh, new stuff. I can buy this and it will help me with that. What I recommend people do is first and foremost, go through what you have at your house. There are really only a handful of things that I would say are required for each each sport. So going in order here, if we start with swimming, for swimming, I recommend goggles. So you can see when you're out out there swimming. For women, I do recommend that you have a couple swim caps. I say a couple because I know every now and then mine will rip. And it's always nice to have that second one in my bag ready to go. And I I do recommend if you, especially if you live in, in the kind of northern half of the U.S. or anywhere where it can get a little chillier, I do recommend getting a wetsuit. You can get one on Amazon for 75 to 100 bucks. You don't have to go out and buy the super fancy Roka Maverick wetsuit that you see or whatever brand you see the uh, professional triathletes wearing. Now you're more than welcome to do that. The reason I say wetsuit is because I know when we get in the water in, you know, June is usually our first race. The water temperatures are still in the 60s. So while there are different options you can get, you know, the swim skin and things like that. Up here, with the temperature, you really are, it's safer for you to have that that full wetsuit. If you want, there are other options you can look into. If you live down someplace warmer like Florida, Texas, uh, Arizona, or, you know, maybe even Southern California where maybe it doesn't get nearly as cold where you are and the water temperature is going to stay in the 70s, then maybe something more like a swim skin makes sense. Again, depending on the race, USA Triathlon has set standards at which your wetsuit legal. And this is only if you were looking to possibly place you. Of course, you can always wear a wetsuit um, regardless of the water temperature, but you would be restricted from actually winning any awards or officially placing in your age group at the end of the race if it was not a wetsuit legal swim. On the bike, the two things that you need is you need a bike that's roadworthy. So a bike that you can safely ride um, on the road If you have a mountain bike, you can use a mountain bike. If you have a road bike, use that. If you have, you know, a mix, there's like gravel bikes, which are kind of in between the two. And then there's all the way to the triathlon bikes. If you're just looking to do this for fun, if you're looking to just kind of knock one race off a bucket list, don't invest money in buying the fancy triathlon bike as tempting as it can be. Find a bike that's roadworthy. This is one of the bigger expenses if you start looking at some of those fancier bikes. Again, the bikes you see the professionals using. You're talking in the ten to twelve plus thousand dollars for these bikes. The other thing you're going to need is a helmet. So, uh, and the helmet needs to have. There's an official tag they'll put in there that at some races I know I've been at they have checked to make sure that it's an official meets certain standards from a you know if you crash and hit your head. One other potential upgrade for the bike that a lot of people look at doing is getting cycling shoes and clips, like new pedals, where you actually, this shoe clips in. The reason why people would possibly make look to make this upgrade is when you do that, 
when you're pedaling, you're able to pull up as well as push down. So you can get a lot more power from your legs and use different sets of muscles throughout that pedal stroke. Clips and shoes, depending on what you get, can it run, you know, you're probably looking a minimum of $100 to buy the two. And of course, you're going to want to make sure you need to buy shoes that, that match the clips that you're putting on the bike. Other thing you're going to want to make sure you have is appropriate clothes and a race belt. So, you know, obviously when you're out running and training and swimming, you're going to need to make sure you have the appropriate clothing. So a lot of people will go out. You can buy off in this. You can get this off of Amazon. You don't need to go buy anything fancy. You know, there are different race. They're called race kits that you can get that have, you know, you can get either two piece. You can get one piece ones. It's whatever you're comfortable with. You can change. There's during transition, you can change uh, however, that will obviously slow you down in the end, and there's not always a changing station. So usually, you know, let's say you want you you're not comfortable wearing your kind of running clothes. Well, you're going to run and bike in underneath your your wetsuit. You wear a swimsuit there. When you get to turn the first transition, chain you could in theory you know take off your wetsuit, pull your stuff on over your swimsuit, hop on the bike, and then you could run. But you're going to want to make sure you have appropriate clothes. Uh, and then you're going to need that race belt for when you go out and do the run. You're going to have your number, your race number, and you're going to need something to attach that to. Uh, it's unlike running races where you quick can, you know, typically you'll see a lot of people uh, safety pin them to their outfit. Again, because you're switching disciplines here and people do kind of change clothes a little bit. Usually you're looking for a race belt and those you can get on Amazon. They're pretty inexpensive. And then lastly, I'd recommend having a training plan. You know, of course, you don't have to have a training plan. You can go out and just swim, bike, and run and go give it a try. But again, if you're looking to make sure you finish the race feeling good, having a plan, knowing at least here are the days that I plan on running, here are the days I plan on swimming, and here's how I'm gonna when I'm gonna bike. Here's when I'm gonna do my, you know, do those two together. You know, swim and uh, bike and swim together to get for my brick session. Having that plan, it's another way to hold you accountable to getting the training in that you're looking to do. And then the other thing that I always do, and this is really not a must have, but when I'm looking at my planning, I look at where can I get my kids involved? So what I've talked about are a lot of the, a lot of the must haves. This would apply to if you, if your kids are involved, a lot of races, um, it, it, the minimum age usually is about 13. But if you go out and look on that TriFinder site or, or, or somewhere else, do Google search, you can find races that are specific for kids, both the duathlons and triathlons. Usually their distances will be a little bit lower if they're under that age of 13. I know my kids have done a couple duath- local duathlons in our town where it's a run, bike, run. And, you know, they have their different age categories. And, of course, it gets harder and longer the older that they are. So that's something for you to keep in mind too, is I look at how can I get my kids involved? So for example, now that I'm back in the office full time, I am doing a lot of my swims at night. Well, my kids, I I need to still spend time with my kids in addition to the fact that I'm working and training. So what I do is because my kids love swimming is on, let's say Mondays, I'll take one of my girls with me. And if I'm swimming again on Tuesday, then I take the other girl with me and then on Sunday or Saturday, we'll usually try to get a family swim in where hubby and I will go swim in the lap lanes together while the kids are playing in the other section of the pool. And as soon as we finish up, we join them and we're playing and we're enjoying just spending time with them. And for things like long runs, I've gone to our rec center where there's a nice path and I've brought the kids bikes and the kids will bike while I run now they can, and I, I do that combination because they can bike faster than I can run. So they'll, you know, they'll stay together. Once they go around a bend or get close to a bend, they'll stop so that they can keep me in sight. And once I catch up, they kind of go off again. And they've loved doing that. And I've been able to knock off a 12 mile run while the kids are biking. And then we started the day that way. And the kids have gotten in a lot of exercise. They've burned through a bunch of their energy, which is always a good thing. And they've had fun doing this. And I've even set them up with, hey, I'll put the GoPro on your bike today and you can record this and you can do that. And giving them fun little chores or, you know, you're responsible for holding the water. And so when I need a water break, 
you know, you bring it over to me and giving them those responsibilities while and involving them in my training has been great. And I've, it's, I'm actually spending more time with them now, I feel like, than I did before because I'm able to do these things with them and have, so, you know, for the swims, for example, I get one-on-one time with them. I get through my swim and then I spend 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how long where we have left in our pool, a lot of pool time to work on their strokes, to play around with them in the pool. And it's not something I had done before, really. So getting that time with them is nice. And then when I'm doing my strength training at home, because largely I do that at home, especially as now we're kind of into, in, into race season, they're doing it with me when I'm home. They're asking to do the programs with me. They're saying, hey, I want to go do that dance thing. Or, hey, let's go. Let's let's work on our arms today. They're excited about it. So involving them at the early ages, it's something that they expect to the point that when I, you know, some mornings when I leave for work, which I leave really early, the girls are up and saying, well, we're up. So why don't I go, you know, they'll go hop on our trainer bike, get some work in before school. (laughs) They're very cute about it. So you can get your kids involved here. There's nothing saying that this has to be just you and you have to constantly find childcare while you're doing your training sessions. Now, you may need to for some of them, especially if you don't, your partner or, or spouse is not available to help you uh, during that time. But you can get your kids involved and my kids have loved it. They really enjoyed it. So most importantly, you need to make sure you're enjoying yourself though triathlons are fun training for them should not feel like a burden it should be something that you enjoy doing I know on the days that I do not train which is rare that I do nothing I feel more tired I almost I get almost antsy in the middle of the day so it's a great way to stay active and stay fit and have that active lifestyle you know there's a triathlon for everyone out there so, you know, there's everything from the sprint races in your, your local towns to something like the Norseman Extreme Triathlon, where you're climbing a mountain at the, at the end of it. There are off-road triathlons that are involve mountain biking and trail runs in addition to the swims. So there's a whole bunch of different things out there. So take a look, find something that works for you. Each week, I highlight a different workout that you can do what work into your routine. This week, we're going to highlight one of my favorite bike workouts, a tempo bike ride. Ideally, you're gonna to wanna to do this right outdoors. First, you're gonna to wanna to start with a 10 to 15 minute warm up to get your legs moving. Then you're gonna do three 10 minute sessions at race pace. So this is the pace that you want to be riding during the race. And you're gonna follow each of those 10 minute sessions with a five minute recovery pace, so easy, Keep those legs moving. You're gonna do that for a total of three times. Make sure to include a five to 10 or even 15 minute cool down at the end to work out any soreness in your legs. That's all for today. Thanks so much for listening. Stay positive and keep training like a mother. See you here next week.